Today, I'll talk about a very personal journey with Loix. And it involves, very briefly, plankton, for a very long time, fluxes, and hopefully for a longer term with you guys about futures. I think there's a convergence in these two journeys. Mine from plankton to participatory planning for LOICs, from fluxes to coastal futures. But I'll focus on the journey about examining nested scales and emergent features. It's our common matryoshka. I've been fascinated by matryoshka dolls. This is the first set that was done back in 1890. A matryoshka set of dolls is a Russian nested dolls, one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other. And each time you take out the new doll, it's different from the one you just removed and very different from the one inside it. This is a story of emergent features. At every scale of complexity, you have a different feature that emerges. So if you don't go through the scales, you'll never know what that feature is. I started out as a plankton ecologist because I had a horrific plankton ecology teacher. She made us do the drying through the alcohol until you paste the darn fe uh, bug in balsam. And so my classmates were so tired of it that they got the pediculus capitis, the head lies, and put it in the balsam and submitted to her as a marine plankton. So bad, so... <laughs> I said, I vow I'm going to go to grad school and be a good plankton ecology teacher. My first foray into it was to determine why this copepod called Akarsha tansa was disappearing in the winter time. It was in the water column at the late spring and emerges uh, until late fall and disappears. It's gone. You can't find it and reappears again the following spring until late fall and disappears again. So my advisor said, okay, you come from a developing country, this might be your only chance to study basic science. So why not solve the mystery of the disappearing bug? <laughs> okay, uh, this is going to be a survival feature in a temperate zone. What am I going to do about this when I go back home? But I did. It's my first matryoshka. I found that females born in the fall would produce a special kind of egg called resting eggs, right when the temperature starts declining very rapidly. And they would increase this resting egg production as day length shortened from fall to winter time. And so they were depositing tons and tons of eggs as the floating females and males were disappearing because they would die. The water was just too cold for them. They stopped eating. If you think about it, for as long as there are many eggs that can sufficiently hatch when the temperature goes back up, then the population can survive. And in fact, if it's timed correctly, when the food blooms, the phytoplankton blooms in late spring, then they can reestablish the population. Voila. Got my thesis. I said, okay, what am I going to do with this? Ah, all right. I've enjoyed it so much. Maybe I can search for survival strategies in a tropical regime where temperature was constant. Pack my bags. Went home with my husband, and waiting on my desk were two sets of funded projects. And my advisor, uh, no, my boss, who was the first SSC chair, Edgardo Gomez, said, you have three letters behind your name. Do something about these projects. 
but I don't know anything about management. What am I going to do? I'm a plant and ecologist. I came back to do survival strategies. You can do that on the side. You don't need plant and ecology. We only need how to deal with our resources. And we're funded. You're funded for the next 10 years to do this. The very first project was looking at this basin called Lingayan Gulf that faces the South China Sea. But the interest was in this highly coralline area that belongs to this coastal municipality called Bolinao. And so if you look at this drawing, you have nested scales. And ecological systems nest very easily. There's no problem. But Social ecological systems also do the same thing. They nest quite nicely, but people do not. They have properties that nest, but the reason why they do not fit the nested scale hierarchy paradigm is because people think and they interact at different scales. They wear many hats at different levels of aggregation. I will share with you in this uh, brief lecture, because Nancy will kill me uh, if I don't finish at 45 minutes. Uh, I will share with you a framework that we use to do science and management at the scale of Bolinao. The whole game in our framework is how to empower resource users to become management partners. And to do that in a developing country scenario, you have to mobilize the community so that they can form platforms where they can interact. And these are your local CRM institutions. But they have to be also informed in a way that they can talk the science to their leaders. This is not to say that they don't know anything. They know a lot about traditional ecological knowledge but it has to be framed in a way that they can converse with leaders, with scientists, and with others. So this was the critical piece. This is public environmental education. This is not inside the classroom. This is in basketball courts or in plazas um, or in the sala of, the, of a Nipahat. So this one was key to this uh, entire process of empowerment. The top three there is an expression of the level of empowerment that community or constituencies would gain so that they can do resource management. They can begin to see if they can diversify livelihood because resource-based livelihood in a degrading system is not your best option if it's the only thing. But this is a multiplier effect. They're encouraged to network with other communities and advocate what they think should be done in terms of solution or mitigation in their environments. The assessments that were done were also crucial. And to the extent that we could bring community members with us in doing these assessments, we did. For example, here, the, uh, the note takers and the ones who would encode the data would be sons of fishermen, because they at least had a high school degree, they could be partners in gathering data. Now, what's crucial to, think in, to see in this graph is that this is numbers of species. Each bar is a species. This is a frequency or an estimate of abundance. And what you see over a four-year time is that diversity is decreasing and abundance is decreasing. So here you have a loss not only of biomass, but you also have a loss of biodiversity. We got to the study area at the time when aquaculture was just beginning. And so the very first thing that they asked us to do was how many pens, how many cages can we put in the channel? Okay. So just by a simple bathymetry and flushing rates, we were able to identify that the black areas are places where they can set up their pens and cages but the uh, pink ones, which are areas of constriction and limited flushing, 
should be left free and open. As a plankton ecologist, I said, well, it's easy with plankton. There's females, there's males, there's copepods, copepodites, nopoleae, etc. But with people, there are many different aggregations that you can come up with. And just for ease of illustration, I have three axes here. Axis on resource dependence, axis on profit, and axis on power. Of course, you would as you would expect, subsistence fishers or gatherers are at the base of these three axes. Power is for the economic elite, such as those, and who also have the most profit from resource-based activities. And you have somewhere in between here, like concession owners or local wholesale um, people and retailers who are somewhere in between. But the reason why we did the stakeholder mapping is that it was our way of determining who would be best to have in focus group discussions, which should be homogeneous, and who you would expect to be talking to each other in an open arena. My first foray into community-based management was one of extremely high transaction costs. And the reason for that is there was no platform for engaging constituencies. And we had to create the platform. These are village associations that organically formed after there were discussions of issues, solutions, and the knowledge base to go with that. So there were all together about five villages, just as a sample here, and they were federated at the municipal level. This is a key component because this was the major means of empowerment. Most of the resource users hardly finished primary level of education, and so they would not even talk to their elected leaders. They would not even talk to us in the beginning because they felt that they were very inferior. They were poor and marginalized, essentially no voice. You put them together because of a common interest or a common concern, and the dynamic changes. You begin to see that their concerns are articulated in a much louder voice. And it went on until they said, we want to incorporate. We want to be registered as a legal entity, we want to have our bylaws. And I said, okay, if you want that, you're willing to support and put in the time, let's do it. So over a span of two years, these five entities plus this federation came about. They negotiated for a zoning of the areas of the municipal waters, one for ecotourism, a second one for aquaculture, a third one where they can establish their concessions for uh, rabbit fish uh, grow out, and a fourth one for their landing sites and trading. They articulated the zoning plan and what activities will be allowed in each zone into a coastal development plan that was legislated and enacted as a municipal law. If you look at the features that I have here, the preferential use of resources by subsistence users, participatory con uh, conservation, and note this third one, the privilege of the private sector, these are people who are the economic elite, uh, to use the fishery resources only if they participate in conservation and management as well. Nice principles articulated. The question is, will they be followed? Within the two years that the law, the municipal law was enacted, the, one of the organizations that I showed you in that box implemented a, a mangrove reforestation because they've lost the mangroves. Another organization, because they were near a spawning ground, established a municipal reserve. So I said, this is too good to be true. Question is, how viable are they over a period of time. So within a two-year framework, 
we could see that science made a difference and that the medium of environmental education was very potent. Yes, there was consensus built across constituents. And in fact, one can say that the researchers were successful within this time frame of evaluation to be in becoming catalysts and facilitators. I come back to this because there were about 20 of us in this project, and we say, how can we replicate this with the amount of mobilization involved to help these organizations from birth to uh, functionality? Can this be a replicable exercise? And, and they said, well, it is worth the empower because of the empowerment uh, aspect. Because if you don't do this, they will just dissipate into their usual uh, you know, village existence without any platform for exchanging ideas and, in fact, for planning. So this still is a question in my mind. I one of our groups under innovation is asking whether institutions should be created for CRMs. 